fund the home and community-based services and they could work and pay a premium um, for Medicaid, which is a path and the only path for people with disabilities out of poverty. And both um, Medicaid through the regular home and community-based services program and buy in offer these long-term care options. So there's two sides of Medicaid. There's the medical side, and that's what most people know about. And that's, um, you know, the, that's regular health care, like doctors, hospitals, um, and, and it could be for disability or not, or just regular preventative care or for an injury. It also includes mental health, which includes substance abuse treatment. And, in, what, and that, all of those are like regular insurance, but what's different than regular insurance is Medicaid covers transportation to your medical appointments and has a limited dental benefit of 1500 a year. For children, there are no limits. Um, and so the, people call that state plan med Medicaid, Magi Medicaid, the expansion population. There's all different words people use. That's not what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about the other side of Medicaid, which is what they call LTSS or long-term services and supports. And those are non-medical services. And they're provided, there's two different ways. One is through what we call waiver programs, and those are home and community-based services programs. And that, that can be, um, you know, personal care, transportation for things other than doctor's appointments, building a ramp, all kinds, you know, all different kinds of stuff, and uh, services and institutions. And I think the, the jury is certainly out that People do better in the community, um, even though there's a choice. I think the state prefers people to be in the community because it's you get better health outcomes and it's better for the state pocketbook as well because it's less le better care at le in a less expensive setting. Um, so the these services are any service uh, that could be an LTSS. Now each waiver has defined specific services, and you'll get information on that. Um, later, but there's there really any service that could help someone of any age function. So for some people, that's physical assistance, like physically, you know, picking someone up and helping them get in the shower. It can also be things like supervision, um, cueing, reminding someone, um, supporting someone to make good decisions, um, as well as things like transportation, um, day programs, etc. So it doesn't have to be just, just physical. It can be cognitive or psychological as well. Um, the other thing that we're making sure everyone understands is someone does not have to be housed to get these services. Now, there might be some services, obviously, like homemaking that you need a home to get. But many of the services are things, again, like transportation or going to a day program are things that, that could uh, seriously benefit our unhoused neighbors who who have disabilities. Um, and people have to be assessed at least annually. And we're gonna spend a lot of time today talking about this assessment and what it is and why we care. So just a quick thing on waivers. Um, so a waiver is basically the term that gets used because going back to the days when the main way people got these services was in institutional settings, and so the state and the federal government had an agreement that was called a waiver, which was here, here's the things where we'll let you, where we, the federal government, will let you, the state, provide these services outside of an institutional setting. Today, the majority of services are provided outside of an institutional setting, um, but we still use the term waivers. So they're waivers for children and adults, and I'll just go over them quickly. The children's waivers, and so for each waiver, you have to meet the level of care, which we'll talk about later, but you also have to meet what they call a target criteria. And that's what this particular waiver is designed for. And each waiver has specific services that, um, that come with that waiver. So for children, there's one for life limiting illnesses and that's people call that the children's hospice waiver, but you don't have to really be in hospice, like usually in hospice for adults, you have six months or less to live and you have to have that terminal diagnosis. For children, you just have to have a diagnosis that limits your life, and you also don't have to forego curative care, which you generally do in hospice, because generally for children, people aren't usually gonna do that. We have children's extensive support, which is for kids with very serious behavioral needs, um, usually, but not always, that's autism. 
Um, and it's for kids that need that line of sight supervision, like constantly, like e including overnight. Um, so the criteria to qualify are pretty tough. We have the CHIRP program, which is the Children's Habilitation Residential Program. And that's, um, a lot of people kind of equate that to like a therapeutic foster home, but you can now get resident, like that level of service in the family home um, as well. And then we have the Children's Home and Community-Based Services or CHCBS, which is more for medically involved children. That was the first children's waiver was that type of waiver. For adults, we have a waiver for people with brain injuries. It doesn't matter if the injury happened recently or a long time ago, as long as you have a diagnosed brain injury, you can qualify for that waiver. Um, we have a community mental health service waiver for people with serious mental illnesses. We have um, one for elderly, blind, and disabled. And we have one, it, it was called the spinal cord injury. It's now called something else, um, something about complementary medicine. And it's for anyone who is um, kind of has paralysis and they provide alternative medicine like um, chiropractor, acupuncture and massage, um, as well as the other services. There are two waivers for people with developmental disabilities. The developmental, the DD waiver is a 24 seven service. It's residential. And again, residential might include living in a family home but it is, um, it's, it's often means, so it's either family caregiver, which is in the family home, group homes or host homes. Host home is the vast majority. Um, and, um, and that's again considered 24 seven care. So everyone in that program has a residential option and a day option. Um, and then there's the supported living services waiver, which is also for people with developmental disabilities. Theoretically, that's supposed to be for people who don't need 24 hour care, but need something less. The reality is that the DD waiver is the only waiver that has a waiting list. And so there are many people on the SLS that do need 24 hour care, but they're on SLS because they don't have to wait for that. So they're on SLS while they're waiting for the other waiver. Um, that isn't everyone, but that's certainly many, many people. And SLS has a number of services that are specific to people with developmental disabilities. So again, the way people have gotten these services has been one way for many, many years, and it's gonna change. Um, the first change is gonna be how the assessment happens. And then the second change is gonna be kind of how it's decided who gets how much and what. Um, and then they're also changing the case management system. So there's a lot of changes going on. And so we're doing these to make sure people know what, what's happening. Um, to make sure that people know what services are available, because there are a lot of people that don't even know any of this is out here, and we want to make sure that people know. And also to understand how the process, you know, what the change is, and hopefully to get some of you involved as people who might be on the ground, because we want to make sure that people understand what's happening so that we can, um, so that we have a lot of eyes and ears on the ground and people watching to make sure that things go the way they're supposed to go. Because with any bit, even even though I don't think anyone intends anything bad, I think with any big change, it, we should expect that there are going to be glitches and problems. And so our job is to prepare for that, prepare for the worst, hope for the best, watch it, and then when, if something goes wrong, really nip it in the bud right away so that we don't get into patterns of bad information or bad practices in our state. So one thing that's important to understand is that a lot of people, they hear there's going to be changes and partly due to history, the first thing they say is, oh, the state's trying to cut Medicaid. They want to get rid of these services or they want to cut them or they're costing too much money. That is not the purpose for these changes. It's not to cut services or benefits at all. There is no budget decrease expected. It's to improve outcomes and services for clients. and it's also to increase the flexibility to make sure that, you know, people are getting the right services in the right time and the right amount, and should probably even say the right place. But what's important to understand is what's right is decided by the client. Um, so I might, 
know someone and I think, oh, you know what? I think you could really use help with transportation. You seem like you're really struggling taking the bus. And, or maybe they're not going out that much. And I think, well, you, you should get transportation. They might say, you know what? Thank you, but I don't want it. Well, they're the ones who decide that. Um, or maybe it's the other way around. Maybe I'm like, well, I don't, you, you look like you should be able to take the bus. Why do you need these rides? Well, they might have information that I don't have about them, or maybe taking the bus doesn't work for them for, for some sort of reason that maybe I don't know. They, the, the client gets to decide what's right. And um, and the state is very well aware. They've seen this. They know what we're saying. So this isn't something where you know we're saying something and the state is saying, oh no no, this was something else. This is um, this is their their position as well. That 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 this is not about cutting services or benefits. And there's actually been quite a bit of work to make sure that when we go to this new assessment, that people who are on the program now don't become ineligible in any way. So are there any questions before I actually start talking about this assessment that I've been kind of hinting at? Okay. Um, I don't see anything in the chat, so I'm gonna go ahead. Um, again, feel free to unmute at any time. So we're gonna cover kind of what is an assessment? Why is there a new one? Who's involved? And quite frankly, why do we care? So, an assessment is to determine if an individual requires what they call nursing home level of care. Um, don't panic um, because, and so a lot of people hear nursing home level of care and they're like, no, nope, forget it, I don't want it, because they think that means that they have to go to a nursing home first to get the care. They don't. People also sometimes think, well, if, if someone from the state or some case manager comes and they think I'm too bad off, they are going to put me in a way in a facility. Well, the state actually can't do that. They'd have to get a court order, and that would be very hard to do. So acknowledging that you need help is actually a way to keep your independence and stay independent. It does not mean that you're going to. It actually reduces, you know, the chances of ending up in a bad situation. Um, Unfortunately, again, because this, these programs originated from the days when it really was like this kind of nursing homes was what everyone did and this was a one-off and that language has just stayed because it literally does take, take an act of Congress to make a change in this kind of language and we know how easily Congress acts, right? So it's just called a nursing home level of care or an institutional level of care. When you're talking to folks, you know, whether it's your peers, your clients, whomever, it's really important to emphasize it's just a word. You, no one is going to make you go to a facility. The, the whole purpose of this is so that you can get those same services in your home and community. Now, if someone wants to go to a nursing facility, this is the same eligibility criteria. So it, if, if someone wants that, that, that no one's going to say they can't have it. We just don't run into people who want that. We want we run into people who want to stay in their community. Um, the only folks I've known who have chosen to go to a nursing facility um, are people, um, you know, recently anyway, are people who have been experiencing long-term homelessness and they get to a point where they're like, I just want to be inside. Um, so the purpose is so that you can get these services and an event, and also it'll help determine which services will be helpful to keep you and which you're eligible to receive. So who does this assessment? So the, it'll be a case management agency. Right now, case management agencies are known as single entry points or community center boards. We'll talk later about what's changing there. But what this assessment is, is they're gonna come, they're gonna have a laptop and they're gonna ask you a bunch of, they will have already asked some questions maybe on the phone or in an email, but they're gonna come and ask you a ton of questions. And that's to find out if you meet this nursing home level of care and determine um, any needs that you have um, in the process. Their presence and questions can be incredibly uncomfortable and scary. 
And this is, again, where we want to talk to people ahead of this to let them know what to expect. Even those of us who are, you know, who've maybe been using these programs a long time and we understand how everything works and we even know the questions they're going to ask, it's still uncomfortable because it's, it's usually someone that you don't know and they're asking super, super personal questions and it can make people feel defensive and uncomfortable. And unfortunately, because we have to make sure that people are at this certain level of care, there's no way to really avoid an assessment that, that just, ha you know, these, these are relatively expensive services and, and the state does have a legitimate reason to, to make sure that people are, are in need. Um, most people don't apply for the service if they're not in need, but the state still just, their, you know, it's government funding, they need to go through the process. So one thing to think about is you can choose who you want involved. Um, so we really strongly recommend, we'll support whatever someone wants, but we strongly recommend, especially if someone's new at it, that they don't go through this alone, that they have someone who knows them well with them. And that's because, again, you have all these questions being thrown at you. Sometimes it's easy to forget. Some, the other thing is it's just a natural tendency. People want to put their best foot forward. So people tend to kind of minimize their needs um, or just think of like the best possible time. So if someone says, you know, like, well, you know, in the past three days, you know, how often have you needed help getting in the shower? Let's just say yesterday was a really good day, but the day before and today were not. The normal, the, the typical way our minds work is we're going to say, oh, well, yesterday I did it myself. I'm fine. And that might lead the, lead the case manager with an inaccurate perception. And if you have a family member, a friend, a caregiver there who can say, yeah, you did great yesterday. And, but today was really a struggle. And the day before yesterday was also really a struggle. It was really scary. You almost fell um, or you did fall or whatever. So it has to be someone that the client's comfortable with. Clients can also ask that they talk to other people separately. So there might be someone who says, I don't want someone sitting there and listening to all my answers, but I know this other person ha understands me and has information about me. And they can just say, I want you to talk to so-and-so because they really get me. And they can do that after. But we really suggest that there be someone there um, and in the event that there's a misunderstanding and it gets into who said what, having that witness can be really important. It doesn't always happen that there's a misunderstanding. I don't want to leave anyone with the impression that that's common, but it can happen. So it's something to think about when you're talking to folks about this is who else can help fill in what your needs are. So they're going to have a a laptop or a tablet or something, and they're going to ask about, first they're going to go through like your level of care, and then that all gets kind of translated, and then they're going to ask about all kinds of needs. So in, in all these different areas of activities of daily living. So even if you're talking about bathing, they're going to ask about the, washing the top half of your body, washing the bottom half of your body. You know, do you just need someone to set up, you, you know, to set up the soap on a scrunchy thing and then you're good or do you need someone to physically wash you they're going to get into a lot of detail and again it's super uncomfortable um and again it's easy to get defensive because I, I know sometimes i feel like i'm being accused of not being able to do something um and um and then the other thing they're going to ask about which is also very hard is they're going to ask about what they call memory, cognition, and behaviors that impact your daily life. So they might ask questions like, you know, do, do you forget things? And, and again, that might be where it's good to have someone else there because people often don't want to admit, yeah, last week I started a kitchen fire because I forgot the stove was on. Or, yeah, I'm always forgetting um you know, what I'm supposed to be doing today. And, and I've tried writing it down in a calendar, but then I forget to look at my calendar. Or, you know, I forgot that I already took my meds and I took them twice, or I forgot to take my meds. As well as some disabilities have behaviors that are challenging. So 
someone with a brain injury might not always be socially appropriate. They might have some sort of, um, like they, they might lack a filter and they might say things that are inappropriate sometimes. So they might say, well, I, I tend to get in arguments everywhere I go because people don't get me. Um, so they're gonna ask all of those questions. We did a little mock assessment in a meeting the other day, um, almost like a role play. And we had stopped to talk to discuss stuff, but it, it takes a lot longer than the current process. So some people might need to break it up into a couple meetings because it might be too much for some people all at once. Um, when you get into planning the supports, they're also gonna ask about, do you have goals? You don't have to have a goal, but you can. Some people's goal might just be, I just wanna live my life. Um, and I really don't wanna to talk to you about my personal goals. Other people might say, I wanna get you, that they might have a goal that they wanna share. Um, I wanna get a job, or I wanna get more hours at the job that I have, or I wanna go back to school, or I wanna learn a new language, you know, whatever it is. And, and the reason that's in there is because people with disabilities should have the right to do more than just exist. Um, they're gonna be asking everyone about employment, obviously age appropriately. They're not gonna be asking someone who's eight or someone who's 98, but they're gonna be asking the vast majority of people about if they want to consider employment because we're allowed to work now and earn money and keep our Medicaid. And then if someone says, well, yeah, but I don't even know how to get started, they can refer them to the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation who could help them figure out what they might be interested in and how to go about getting a job. Um, they'll also ask about your routines and if you need things to be a certain way. And they'll ask about quote unquote natural supports. Um, the reason I put that in quotes is that natural supports is sometimes code for getting family members or other people to do work that should be paid for free. And we wanna make sure people understand that it they don't have family members, unless there's a legal obligation, but family members do not have a legal obligation to just provide unlimited care without being paid for it. Often we will choose to do go above and beyond for our loved ones and that's totally fine. Some people um, in some families, people want their, they only want their family to care for them. And they, and so maybe just having family members as you're paid and unpaid caregivers is fine. For other people, they don't want their family members doing that kind of personal care. And that actually hurts the relationship. There's no one wrong or right way to do it. What we want to make sure is that people don't say, oh yeah, my, um, my spouse has been doing this therefore I'm okay and don't need anything when that might, it might be too much on the spouse. And I know a few years ago, my, my mother had a stroke and, and she's you know mostly recovered, but she was unable to drive for a long time. And all of these friends were saying, oh, do you need anything? Can I drive you somewhere? And she's like, no, no, my husband's doing it. He's fine. And he's like sitting there saying, but I am so sick of it as someone else. So often when someone says that someone's doing it, it's important to know that, that may or may not be okay. With, with the person who's doing it. And it, we also wanna make sure that we're not burning out our family members because they're often the ones who are in there for the long haul. A lot of times, so if someone has like dementia or a cognitive disability and maybe can't be left alone, the care might impede the ability of, of that family member to work. And if they're not able to work outside of the home reliably, meaning they're not getting called home every third day, it might be it might be necessary for them to be the paid caregiver because you can't you know most people that we know can't just not be, can't just go without a paycheck indefinitely because they have to pay their own bills and so we're lucky in Colorado that for the for adults we we don't have it for kids yet hopefully that'll change soon but at least for adults family members are able to be paid to take care of their loved ones if that's what everyone wants. Um, people could, will also be invited to tell their story and that'll be, some people say, I, I don't wanna keep saying the same thing over and over. So this story will get in your record. Some people want someone to hear how they ended up needing long-term care. 
Um, some people don't. Some people are like, you know what? I know what I need. I know what I want. I really don't want to share anything more. That's okay too. Another thing you can include there is information you might like people to know before coming into your home. Um, Mona's heard me say this so many times, she's probably sick of it, but like, like for me, one thing I want people to know before they come in my home is that I have two large, and thank God they're being quiet right now, but that's not always the case, um, large, very exuberant dogs. And I want people to know that, um, A, to know that they're friendly, even though they make this like horrific racket at the door. Um, but also if someone's afraid of dogs, they're probably, probably coming to my house is not a great idea because it's, it's a small house and there isn't really somewhere else to put them. So, um, so just something like that, that you might want someone to know, or maybe you have a, a religion where people are expected to remove their shoes before entering the house. Someone's not going to know that, or, or maybe it's just your personal preference. Um, someone's not going to know that ahead of time. Um, a lot of people who need like communications accommodations could put this here. Um, there'll also be another place in the system to put it. But, you know, if someone's deaf, it would be really good to know that before you show up to, so that you get a sign language interpreter, for example. Um, or if someone can't speak, don't call them on the phone when not leave an email or text address and wonder why they're not calling you back. So after, so, so the first step is level of care. And through the level of care, you qualify for home and community-based services. Now there's a financial part too, but after you qualify, the case manager will tell you um, what you qualify for. And they, and it might, a lot of people might qualify for two different waivers. Now you can only be on one waiver at a time. But right now, the way the system is, is you have to kind of know which waiver you want, and then you get assessed for that waiver. Whereas now you're going to be assessed for HCBS, and then they'll tell you if you qualify for more than one, what you qualify for and what the different benefits may be. And then after that, so after that's done, then they kind of go on to the next part of the assessment and develop a support plan. You have a mandatory check-in every quarter and, and, and a little bit more detailed one at the six month point with the case manager. Now in most of the rural communities, and I don't know if this is true everywhere. So in the urban communities, usually you get someone who does the intake and, and assessment, and then it gets passed on to what they call an ongoing case manager. And that's the one for long-term. I think in some of the rural areas, they actually, whoever starts it stays with the case. There's also a little less turnover, I think, in rural areas. Um, whereas in the front range, like, you know, it says like they follow you through the year. That might be three different people because they don't, there's a lot of turnover. Um, so you're going to get a copy of these slides after and you'll be able to look at every single service and every single waiver. So, you know, so for example, acupuncture is only available in that one waiver I talked about that used to be called spinal cord, whereas alternative care facilities available in a number of waivers as is adult day service. Um, adaptive recreation, I think is only available in the developmental disabilities waivers, but there's tons of, tons of information on these links that you'll get. Um, they'll also go over your rights and responsibilities. Um, and again, you need to be part of the development of your plan and you get to choose who else you want involved. Um, I'm not going to read this, but they, um, you know, getting these services is not done to you or for you. It's done with you. So you do have rights. Um, and, and again, these are, I'm not going to read these um, out loud, but these are important rights. I did want to, though, talk about if something goes wrong, what your what your options are. And I wanted to talk briefly about a grievance and an appeal, because people get these confused all the time. A grievance is about how someone acts. So if you feel your case manager was insensitive or rude, or if you have like if there's bad quality and no one will help, or if you are trying to get a question and you can't get a response or a response in a reasonable amount of time. Then you file a grievance and you always file a grievance with the agency that 
you feel is a problem. Now that doesn't mean if you have a problem with the provider that you can't call your case manager, of course you can. But usually grievance processes are internal. And people say, well, why bother? Aren't they gonna just say, you know, do, do, you know, do it what we see on, on social media all the time. Thank you for sharing this valuable information. Please DM me for more, you know, with details or thank you for sharing, you know, whatever. And, and it just, nothing ever happens. Maybe, but the state makes all of these, uh, everyone who deals with Medicaid, whether they're a case management agency, certain providers keep track of their grievances and what they've done about it. And for the one, so, so if the state monitors and they see, oh, gee, there are these constant grievances that, that the same thing over and over, they're clearly not learning, the state can then change their provider agreement and put them, put that, put some different standards in. How often and how well that's done is certainly debatable, but the, uh, the more important thing is the people that are actually trying to run their programs in a good way and that want to do a good job need to know if something isn't going well because otherwise they're not going to know. If it's a large agency or even a small one, the director might not be at the front desk when the phone gets answered. So they might not know, and they're certainly not gonna be sitting there all day. So they might not know if someone is being rude. Um, and sometimes it might just be, a, hey, the employee was having a really bad day. And then you can coach someone on how to take a break before you take it out on someone. Uh, it might be that they're looking at stuff and they're seeing, gee, you know what, whenever someone calls and maybe English isn't their first language, we're getting these complaints. We need to do something deeper about this. Um, you don't know unless you get these grievances so that you can either address an individual and it shouldn't be about, oh, you're fired, but it should be about how do we change this behavior and look at the system, look at the data systemically. An appeal is different. An appeal is a formal process with a different entity. An appeal is about what you get. So an appeal might be, we don't think you met the nursing home level of care. It might be about, you think you need six hours of care a day and they think you need three. It might be about, um, you think you need a, a home modification and they don't. Um, it could be about anything, but it's always about what you get. So it's about, it's either you are eligible or the amount of what you're getting or the type of service. And that's a formal process where an independent administrative law judge hears your case. And you have a right to appeal anytime a service or benefit is denied, reduced, terminated, or you've, you've asked for service and it's not acted upon. So that's called an adverse action. And we help people with appeals in Medicaid. It, it's, it can be a little bit of a daunting process, but you don't need a lawyer. Um, and often just filing appeal stops the adverse action because they know they're gonna lose. So, um, so we have a saying that we stole from our friends at Colorado Legal Services, and that's appeal first, think second. If someone gets a no, they should file an appeal because you have a quick timeline. And you can always withdraw it. If you, if you realize, you know what, I really wasn't eligible for that service, or I think they're right, I really don't need that much care, you can always withdraw it. But if you don't file it in time, you could lose important rights. So if things don't, don't go well, there's, there's appeals and grievances depending on the problem. So as clients, we have responsibilities. So one is the hardest one I think is to give accurate information about how much help we need. It's again, it's easy to try and make ourselves look like we're, we need less than we do. Um, we need to let our case manager know about changes in our, in our support system, our health. The thing about cooperation is, in case, is you should do that when it's appropriate. So if someone says, I need to do a home visit and I have to come today, that's not appropriate and people shouldn't be expected to cooperate. If they say, I need to do a home visit um, can you give me some times over the next few weeks that'll work? You should cooperate. You also want to just give common courtesies. If you are, you know, if you have someone coming to the house to help you with homemaking and you're not going to be there, let them know so they don't go all the way across town or even down the street for that matter. That's just common courtesies. And again, if, if you're not getting the services that were on your plan, you really need to let them know because someone might be billing for them and 
that's a serious problem. Any questions before I move on? Is there anything in the chat? All right, I'm not seeing anything. Julie, I just want to address something. Uh, I want to say thank Patricia in the chat. And, and I think it's a good idea uh, if we get more people requesting Spanish interpretation, we certainly can include that since this is a, a project that we're doing with the Department of Healthcare. Oh, you mean for this presentation? For public presentations like this one. Yeah, this. Abso absolutely. And we do have this uh, in Spanish and English um, available, recorded. Right, Jose? Yes, we do. We do. But, um, but since this is live, uh, and yeah. and they get to we, they get to interact with you and Mona. I think yeah. that would be cool to have. No, absolutely, yeah. We um we can absolutely do this. Um, you know, provide interpretation not just for this, but for anything we do. Um, and we're actually in the process of hiring a Spanish speaking advocate um, for the Western Slope um, as we as we speak. So, um, and we're, we're kind of wrapping up this phase, but we're gonna have another presentation in a few months that's gonna get into a lot more detail about the actual assessment and how it works. That will also be available in English and Spanish. So just kind of going over, so what's gonna change and what's not gonna change. The current assessment only determines the level of care and eligibility. The new one will allow the state to, it, again, it'll be kind of two parts. So part one will be level of care, part two will be your needs, but it'll, it'll roll into an actual support plan and it'll allow the state to identify all needs and allocate services based on the results. So that means it's gonna be longer and they're gonna talk about more things. The other thing that we're super excited about is everyone's gonna get asked about self-direction. Right now, not everyone knows even what it is or what they can self-direct and employment, as I talked about. Now, for people with developmental disabilities, they get put through what's called a SIS, which is on top of the what we have now, which is called the Supports Intensity Scale. And families have described it to us as it's like an interrogation. It's horrible. And a lot of people, it doesn't include a lot of things that are what cause people to need help. And one of the reason, one of the things we're very excited about is once all, this whole process is done, including what we talk about at the end, which is the budget, um, the budget process, the, the CIS will go away. And we think that's a wonderful thing because the CIS has been a huge, very complicated, non-transparent problem. Julie, can, so, you clarify, can you clarify? I know this is a little besides the point of this presentation, but just pretty quick, as quick as you can. Can you clarify something? I have heard that the SLS, you cannot qualify unless you are 18 or older. Is that true? Mm hmm Yeah, same with EBD. Okay, okay. I was wondering because of the removal of the of the requirement for lawful presence in the United States. Yeah, no, that, that's a totally separate issue, but it's um yeah, SLS is an adult waiver. Okay. Thank you. Um so the only waiver I think that starts at 16 is the brain injury waiver. Um so in the current system, only people in the in the, in the developmental disabilities um system have to use an algorithm. Um, and, and I'll talk later about what that is. In the new system, everyone's gonna have to use it. Um, and, and again, the current, al the current algorithm, which is called the SIS, is, is not transparent and there's no exception process. That's gonna change. And the biggest thing is right now, what you get depends on where you live. So, and because there's never really been a lot of clarity, there's never been recorded standardized trainings or skills testing. So, it, you know, different people have gotten different training at different times. So you might have two people with the exact same set of needs and one person gets literally double what the other person gets. That's really unfair. Um, and so this is supposed to make things more fair across the different regions and more predictable so that if two case managers 
both do the do an assessment, they should get the same result. Um, so again, this is not to reduce services um, or reduce eligibility at all. Um, there's a link in here to the whole, there's a whole website, web page you know, dedicated to this and you can look at all of the modules, see all the different questions, um, that, that's all there on this link. So any questions before I talk about case management? Okay, so they're also redesigning case management. And right now, the system is, if you have a developmental disability, you go to what's called a community center board. If you go, if you have any other kind of disability, you go to a single entry point. Children are mixed between community center boards, single entry points, and sometimes private case management agencies. Um, so, What's going to happen is we're just going to have something called a case management agency that will serve people with all types of disabilities, regardless of the waiver that they're seeking. Um, we also have a link in here about the, the, that web page. So why are they doing this? Um, there's two main reasons. One is it, someone have a question. Okay, if you have one, just speak up. Um, so is right now we have um, not so much in the single entry point system, but in the community center board system, um, we don't have what's called conflict-free case management. Now, A, it's a requirement of the federal government that we have it, but that isn't what's important. I mean, that's important, of course, because they pay, they give us half the money, but it's also important because it's just best practice to not have a conflict. So what does the conflict mean? So um, when you work with someone, hopefully, if it's unless it's like a horrible working environment, you do have some trust in the people you work with. You don't, hopefully you don't think that they're all just total jerks, that you, you like them and you trust them. So if you're a case manager and um, let's say I'm a case manager and Jose is my client and I'm trying to help Jose get some sort of service and I know Mona and I know that she provides that service in her department. And then there's some other agencies outside and I don't really know who they are. I'm, I might say you have a total choice to get whatever services you want, um, to get them from any place you want. But I might also say, oh, but do you know, um, you know, I have this friend Mona and she works right down the hall. I can just run and talk to her and see if they can help you. And then that way, you know, if there's any problem, I, I know exactly who to call. Um, but I can give you a list of everyone. You might not even mean to sound biased. It just might be. Um, so let's say that we do so that. He says, yeah, that sounds good. Do that. So I do that. And then they come back and say, you know what? The person isn't showing up. Well, because I see Mona every day and I know that she's a hard worker, I might say, oh, there must be some mistake. So I might go say to Mona, hey, I'm sure this was a mistake, but this is what I'm hearing. And I might be, and then if, if Mona says, well, no, that's just not true, I might be less inclined to really dig into it because it's just natural that we trust people we work with. If everyone, if every possible provider is someone that you have a business relationship with and that you understand your job is to hold people accountable, it doesn't mean that you have to be mean or ugly or not be understanding if someone says, hey, I'm really trying, this is the problem but it does mean you're gonna be a little more even-handed and it just gets rid of that bias that is usually unintentional. Um, and, and in some areas there might, you know, we know that there's been pressure by the, because sometimes you have these agencies where they have case management and they have other services and the other services is how they make money. So there might be some, but even if no one says it explicitly, some buzz about, hey, if we don't get our numbers up with this service, we're gonna have a budget problem. And if we have a budget problem, we're not gonna have raises next year. That, that stays in people's heads. And that doesn't mean they're bad people. It just means they're human. So they really need to get conflict out of the system. And we understand in small areas, that's gonna be hard and there may need to be a few exceptions, but we're hoping that with this change, there'll be a way for every community to have a pure case management agency. 
um, that, that will be, have the freedom to not have to provide services. So in every community now, the single entry points and the, and the community center boards are talking and, and working out who's going to do what. So it, if you have some community and this, the community center board says, we, we, we're good at providing services, but we have these 12 case managers, they might all get hired by the single entry point. Um, so it might be that someone doesn't even lose their case manager. They're just working for a different place. In Mesa County, the Rocky Mountain Health Plans took the single entry point contract from the county a couple of years ago. And they just hired everyone from the county and the supervisor is running that program now. So it was a different company, but it was the same people. Um, now there might be someone for whatever reason who doesn't want to go, but there are people who quit their jobs too. The other reason for this is to have better accountability and management. So right now there's community center boards and single entry points and they have different regions. One has 20, one has 24. They don't necessarily overlap. So there's like 44 different contracts the, the community, they're all they, they have two different designations in state law. Some are run by the county, some are not. It is very hard to really manage, hold accountable, and, and the, because they're doing so much running around and managing these different systems, they're not spending as much time on what's the right contract, how do we make meaningful, good training for all the case managers, how do we provide support as a state, so they'll be able to have fewer contracts and do a better job of accountability and management, which includes providing decent training, which, which has not been the case. So are there any questions now before I kind of get on to the last part of my piece? Um, there is um, a question in, okay. Spanish in, the, in the chat. Uh, what happens if the, man, the case manager of hospital doesn't know the system and is limited in, in the way they can follow up in cases. Uh, what happens if who, if the Medicaid who? If a case manager from a hospital. Uh, oh, a hospital. Who, who knows very well the system, uh, but it's limited in the, in, the, in the way they can do follow up in the case. Uh, can we help them? Yes, we, 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 I mean, yes, we, we can help them. But one of the things we're also trying to do is, is to help, help the case managers understand the hospital ones where they should be calling, because ideally they should be hooked up with a single entry point or a community center board or eventually a case management agency. But it's also important that they get hooked up with community advocates. So, because it, one, of the, one of the ways people end up in nursing homes is they're in a hospital and they just have to be discharged really fast and often you can't set everything up really fast. So the nursing home is the, is the path of least resistance and that's really uh, concerning. Um, so yes, that's a really excellent question, whoever asked that, um, re really excellent, so. Because that that's a huge problem and a huge a huge place where there needs to be a lot more systemic work done. And I um, apologize. The, the the translation wasn't perfect since I'm not an interpreter, but I tried to do it as best as I could. Okay. Well, thank you. It, it was I'm sure better than what I could do. So, um, any other questions in the chat or any other questions? Okay, so with this budget algorithm, and I want to be really open that just because they say put the word person centered in front of it doesn't mean that it's something that we're 100% comfortable with. Um, but most states are going, you know, because these programs are growing, most states are going to either some sort of algorithm or letting some managed care company make all the decisions or both. So we kind of, we're working with this because we feel like there's going to be something and it also is more equitable to have one process for everyone than to have the people that know the system well get what they need and no one else does which is what we have now so um 
but that doesn't mean that it's not something that we're watching carefully and with a little bit of fear. Um, but we do think that something needs to happen because that you can't do like totally individualized planning for like 100,000 people and, and growing that just can't, you know. So the states, so first of all, this isn't going to happen until at least 2024. Once this new assessment tool comes out, which is taking a lot longer than anyone thought, they've got to collect a full year of data before they can even develop this tool. But an algorithm them as a computer program. We hear a lot about algorithms when we think about things like Facebook, but it's a step-by-step -step process to solve a math problem. So the results from the assessment will, will feed pieces of data into a program that will then determine like a range of spending that should meet their needs. And within that range of spending, people will be told what, 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 they, what they are allowed to buy with it. So it might be that you get a certain amount of money and you can choose, you know, I want to spend 50% on personal care and 50% on day program, or I want to spend 100% on personal care, or I want to spend 50% on transportation and 50% on employment supports, whatever, you know, that people will be able to choose, but the level of help they need will determine a dollar amount. Um, so the two things that make us, that, that we pretty much said were like an absolute deal breaker is one, there'll be an exception process and two, one, we'll know exactly how it works. Now, I can't tell you now how exactly how it's gonna work because it's not been designed yet. So when we started hearing about this, we went and did some research around the country of how these things work. They can work well or they can be a disaster. So we, we went to the state, not we didn't physically go, but we had calls with the states and advocates from the states where there have been bad problems. And there's three things in common with states that have, where this has been a disaster. One is managed, is, they're, all, they're all managed care states. They're all states where some corporation may, is, is kind of has control over all of long-term care. In Colorado, not only do we not have that, but we have a state law that says you can't. There's also in these states, like we have with the CIS, no transparency. So no one knows how, like, if I answer these questions, uh, I answer these questions, how did I possibly get this result? Like we had someone with the CIS, her adult child went from not having a seizure disorder to having a severe one. She redid the CIS and nothing changed and none of us could figure out why. That should have increased her, her score. Um, and there's no exception process. It is what it is. So those were the three things that said, um, no, we, this is not going to work. So we made sure we already have the managed care thing handled, but we made sure to demand the transparency and an exception process. And I think with the exception process, if you know, because no matter how good of a job you try and do, you're never going to have everyone on board for an exception process. I mean, you're never gonna be able to get every single situation. There's always gonna be the thing you didn't think of where it's a totally legitimate need and it's like one in a million cases. So you don't need to change the whole system. You just need to make an exception. Or if you keep getting people with the same situation asking for the exception, you can tweak the algorithm because then that means something's wrong and how, how it's spitting out that information or something's wrong in the mathematical equation. Um, so, um, so, um, and again, that the algorithm is going to be in a few, um, in a couple of years, but it's something, it, but part of why it's important now is it's important not, so not just to qualify, but to make sure that you're answering all of the questions, um, really, really completely because it's that data that's going to get used to build the algorithm. So that's why it's important to kind of know that that's coming now so that you can help folks. So um, any questions? Because I'm going to turn it back to Mona to talk about how you can get involved. Thank you, Julie. Yes, yeah, so we at Card Across Disability Coalition strongly feel that people who are most impacted and are affected, directly affected, are involved because they we have the loudest voice. And that's what helps us 
get what we need. And so some of the ways to go at, or get involved, number one is to become an um, advocate um, on an advisory board with a, a case management agency. Secondly, is to become an advocate with part, a volunteer advocate with Colorado Cross Disability Coalition. Uh, we're starting that program uh, statewide so that individuals within your communities, can, you can help them get the services that they need. And then there's the person-centered budget algorithm, which Julie just uh, discussed. And the state will be, um, will be announcing that, I think it's going to be at least a year. So you'll, if you're signed up with uh, John Barry, uh, who works for the state, and he sends out weekly information about meetings and memos and upcoming changes, it's a lot of great information there. So you can be on the lookout for that. And his email, you'll all be receiving these slides. And so his email is john.r.berry at state.co.us. And then we are, I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation about the subcommittees. We have three, we have the outreach subcommittee, we have the uh, Colorado Signal Assessment, which is the new name for the new assessment, and case management redesign. The new assess the Colorado Signal Assessment and the case management redesign meet once a month for about an hour. And everyone is welcome to join those subcommittees if you would like to learn more. And the best way to do that is to contact me. My contact information is in the slides and I will put that in the um, chat box. Nina, could you also include John Barry's information in the chat so people yeah. have it? Yeah. In, in the presentation that you're gonna get, we have a bunch of FAQs, like frequently asked questions that, um, you know, that will, you know, like all of these different questions. So you'll have that. We, we don't, again, don't feel like we need to read it to you and go over it, but, um, but that'll be there. So- also, then, One thing yeah. that I wanted to add, Mona and Julie, I'm sorry. Uh, there was an interesting question by Patricia Galeto she asked it to me in Spanish, and she said, is there a way or, or a, a specific strategy that we can use so that people are not being denied? And my answer to her in private was, I mean, sadly no, sadly that's, this, is, this is why. We always say it's better to have an advocate representing you so that if you get denied, we can get you through that door, if you will. Right, but but I would I would say that the way what we're doing is kind of, you know we want people to know you know what their rights are so that they can tell people generally if you need help on more days than not in the community you should qualify. So if you like if you and it doesn't again like I said at the beginning it doesn't have to be physical help but if you need another human to get through your day they should qualify like that any person who needs that should qualify. Again, unless like they don't qualify financially or something like that, but if they qualify financially, they should qualify. Um, that's a, so, yeah, that's a good addition. Thank you, Julie. Yeah, and so and so to make sure that people know. So if, if someone says, first of all, the other thing to know is that anyone who wants an assessment can get it. So the first step is is usually a call or an email to a case management agency. They'll ask you some questions, and they they can't say to someone it doesn't look like you're going to qualify um and, and but they can but they cannot prohibit you they they need to then offer you to say but you, if you want an assessment we will we will do one um and, and they shouldn't be saying it doesn't look like you're going to qualify unless the person like says outright i never need help with anything you know 
And again, that that's even then they should say, is there someone else we can talk to? Because kind of like, why is there a referral then? Um, and that's someone. Another one to clarify something, and Patricia, yeah. just so do you know, what we are talking about is not general Medicaid, it's not the, the, the medical side of Medicaid. We're talking about the RPSS side. So the, the criteria for that include disability, mobility, et cetera. So it's, 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 it's way more specific than, than meaning, for example, medic, emergency Medicaid, if you don't have a disability, but something happened, right? It's, it's very different. Right, right. But yeah, this is, so I'm talking about long-term, but we do help people with appeals for regular Medicaid as well. Um, but usually it's a long-term Medicaid where there are bigger problems. So, um, and so everyone has, again, everyone has the right to an assessment. Everyone has the right to have someone with them if they want. They also have the right to have the assessment accessible to them. So if someone needs an interpreter, whether it's language, whether it's sign, they have to provide that. They can't say, well, oh, you spoke English on the phone. I think you can do it. If they, if someone says, I'm not, I'm comfortable in whatever language, they need to get them an interpreter. Um, if someone, let's just say you have someone, and this, this will happen a lot with, you know, people who have like frail health or they're all, you know, some people, as they're older, they might just have less endurance. Um, it, if someone says, I can only do 45 minutes at a time, but it might take three or four times to come back. They have to do that. They have to provide it in a way that's workable for the client. If a client says, um, we have a lot of members like this, like some who say, um, I, it takes me forever to get going in the morning. I can't do anything before noon. Um, or conversely, after about one in the afternoon, I start fading and I've got to have a morning appointment. If someone has one of those needs, they have to provide that. Those are reasonable accommodations and they have to do that to make the process accessible to the client. So you need to tell clients, you know, people who might be applying, it's okay to ask for what, not only is it okay to ask for what you need, it's really in everyone's best interest to ask for what you need. Some people have been conditioned to think that they're like, they shouldn't ask for stuff. Um, and really it makes the process better for everyone. Like if someone really understands, you know, whether that's because they're getting it in the right language or because they're not exhausted, they're not, you know, in brain fog when they're trying to answer these important questions. So, um, and we definitely want to hear, CCDC wants to hear immediately if someone is denied any of those accommodations, if someone asks for that and they're told no, that kind of thing where we, we really, really, really want to hear, even doesn't want us to get involved hopefully they would at least allow us to know about it because we have to, we have to manage those problems. We, we need to make sure that, that, you know, we really need to stop those because that's, the, this has to be available and accessible to everyone and everyone means everyone. You need one more thing. Let's say, let's say mm -hmm. that in a few weeks or a few months, there's a, a reoccurrence of the pandemic. And, and there is an order to close down, whether it is COVID or whether it is the monkey thing. Uh, uh, and say someone really, really prefers or can only work with someone in person rather than Zoom or simply does not have access to technology or internet. Is that a reasonable accommodation as well? Um, you know, I I, I don't know. I think it depends on the extent of the danger. I mean, when we locked down before, it was no, everyone had to do it remotely. And, um, you know, that's probably where the advocates would come in and help someone get through it. Um, you know, and, and a lot of people did stuff just by the phone during those times. And, and again, we had some cases where we had to then step in because it was not done properly by the phone because the client didn't have the capacity to really focus for that long. And so the client said some things that were not accurate, um, you know, like or didn't explain, or the case manager couldn't see certain things that would have been really obvious and the client didn't know that the case manager didn't know. So it was no, no one trying to do anything deliberately. It was just a big misunderstanding. But it, it but in, in the, you know, in 2020, I think we all, I think everyone felt that was the safest for everyone 
before any of us had vaccinations. Then, in, then recently the state, then in 2021 at some point, the state said case management agencies can go into the home if they're vaccinated and if, and if everyone agrees. And in 2022, they said, you must go into the home if, unless the client says we don't want it. Um, but then, and then it's going to move to when the public health emergency ends, clients have to have it in the home unless there's some really good reason, but it can't just be, I don't want it. So I, I don't think I could, someone, that was a very long-winded way of saying, I don't know that I can answer that because it, um, I think it depends on the perceived danger at the time. And again, what we learned with COVID is we just didn't know. And so, you know, we didn't know, and we still don't. I mean, you know, no. we're still- And that's, that's exactly what I wanted you to explain. Because I think that I, there's a misconception. I think that there's a misconception that anything falls into, or can fall into an original accommodation. And there are times where that might not be true. Right. Right. Like, like if, if I just don't want someone in my home, that's not a reasonable accommodation. If, if I have like a super severe anxiety disorder and having a stranger in my home is going to put me in the hospital, that might be, but it might be it, but it might be, okay, if I can have a trusted person here, that might be the mitigation instead, because they do want to make sure that you know, that your home is being taken care of, that you're being taken care of. There's a reason to lay, I mean, again, a lot of us don't like it. I don't like it, but there is a legitimate government reason to lay eyes on because if someone, you know, and we, unfortunately, sadly, we've had these situations where someone is getting paid to take care of someone and then someone goes in the home and it's clear that like no one's washed the dishes in two months or that the person is not getting showers and they have this like gaping wound that's not okay and we need to make sure that people are not being left in those kinds of situations so there, there, there are a lot of competing ideas here or competing issues julie before we end the meeting i wanted to just mention that uh, we will be sending out the slide deck and this is being recorded so we will be sharing the link to yes. the recording uh, once we have it and uh, when we have, oh, yeah, when we have our second, um, when we have our second set of these, um, which will be in a few months, we will let you know, and we will be doing a round two. We're kind of wrapping up the round ones, but we will be we will be letting everyone know who's who's like kind of on this list of the round twos. Mm -hmm. But again, we're just starting to put that together because we we're just getting access to the system. So that'll be a couple months. Oh, also, if anyone wants the recording, please, uh, uh, and you did not register, uh, just can spare the moment, please make sure to leave your contact information in the chat room. Uh, I will leave mine too, uh, because someone is requesting. So. Yeah. And then just two more points on the slides there. Um, when you scroll down after the frequently asked questions, there are several sides with slides with links to uh, documents and websites. Uh, and so some very useful information there. And yes. if you need to get some help, there's a link to our um, volunteer group uh, that meets uh, Monday through Thursday. And so you can, It'll have a form at the bottom, fill that out, and then um, they'll be sure to get uh, in touch with you. And then one last piece, we do have a poll. If you would please uh, take the time to us, I will post it right now. Thank you, Mona. You're welcome, Julie. And thanks everyone for taking time out of your Monday.